This video is sponsored by Movie Palette. Hello and welcome back to Projector at the London Film Festival for the spoiler discussion of Glass Onion, where I talk about the things that I didn't get to talk about the first time around. Obviously, this is not my full thoughts on the movie. If you want that, go and see my previous video, which I'll link right up here. But really, this is just me discussing the things that I couldn't actually talk about the first time due to the fact that they are massive spoilers. And obviously, if you haven't seen the movie yet, you should probably do that before watching this video. Or just simply you don't care, in which case, fine, be my guest. Either way, this is going to reveal crucial critical plot details about the movie. Obviously the biggest, most significant thing about Glass Onion that I didn't get to speak about the first time around was Janelle Monet's character. Or should that be characters? That's right, she's got a dual role. She's not just playing Andy, she's playing Helen, her twin sister. That's right, the movie has a twin gambit in it. And that's perhaps Johnson's most audacious stunt when it comes to the plotting, because twins is one of those plot points that can go very badly wrong, particularly in a murder mystery setting and I knew that Andy was probably going to have a secret about her like all the other characters especially because she's so mysterious and enigmatic in the first half of the movie but I certainly didn't expect this and like the first movie Glass Onion hinges on a critical flashback although in Knives Out that came relatively early we knew what Martha was hiding right from the beginning of the movie so the film aligned us with her, whereas in Glass Onion, that happens later. Much of the second half takes place in this flashback, which adds new context to what's been going on, because as it turns out, Andy has already been killed off before the movie even starts. Her sister Helen steps into her shoes to try and figure out who killed her. So in that way, the movie is almost toying with you for a lot of the first half. You think you're waiting for the murder mystery element to happen. It's almost an hour before Dave Batista snuffs it. Again, following the rule from See How They Run about how the least likable character is always the first one to die, except he isn't because chronologically Monet's Andy is really the first victim and his death was to cover that up. And I do have to admit that it makes a lot of sense for someone as stupid as Batista's character to try and blackmail a murderer. Yeah, that traditionally works out very well for everyone, doesn't it? But going back to this, this means that Monet has to do not only a dual role, but multiple layers in that dual role. We got Andy, as we see her in the flashbacks, Helen, and then Helen as Andy, which makes it an enormously complicated part to play. And like Anna de Armas, I think this is going to be a star-making role for Monet. She is absolutely fantastic in this movie, especially once the twist is revealed, because she shows some really adept comic timing. So that makes Helen another outsider in the same way that Blonk is, who obviously she's working for the whole time. So she has a very clear eyed perspective on Miles's egocentric circle. When she, pretending to be Andy, says that each of them will gladly betray Miles if they could get his crown. She's not saying that as Andy, who was actually betrayed by Miles. She's saying that as someone who knows these people for only a few hours, but even so, their duplicitous nature is very apparent to her. She's also very intimidated and nervous about the fact that she has to keep up this facade, and as a result, she starts drinking to quell her nerves, and that's where a lot of the comedy comes in, because she's actually quite a good drunk especially at keeping in character, apart from the fact that she's so tipsy that she can barely keep her balance sometimes. And Johnson basically pulls off a Back to the Future Part 2 with this flashback where scenes from the first half of the movie replay in the second half, but from Helen's perspective, which completely flips them. And because of that, it becomes very amusing to see her kind of improvise or kind of trip up every so often. But it's kind of hidden because the characters don't really notice sometimes because they're just simply too self-absorbed. In that way, 
way, there's a lot of really brilliant scenarios that are cooked up, and certainly it makes the editing of the movie make sense, particularly in the first half, where you see glimpses of what's happening, but without the context, and then you understand retroactively why those scenes were cut that way, and you go, oh, the clues have actually been playing out in front of me in clear sight the whole time. And that, of course, embodies the title of the movie. As I said, Glass Onion refers to multiple things. Obviously, it's the big centerpiece of Miles's estate, but that refers back to the name of the bar that him, Andy, and their friends all met up in back in the day. And Andy's bar napkin is a major plot point all throughout the movie. And those flashbacks are absolutely hysterical with the deliberately outrageous period costume choices for each of the characters but especially Miles, who is dressed up like Tom Cruise in Magnolia. And that has to be a deliberate detail from Johnson. I feel like I was the only person in my screen that actually noticed that. But believe me, once you do, it's absolutely hysterical. But of course, the most significant meaning of Glass Onion is thematic, because that's the theory posited by Benoit Blanc. He, of course, previously had the donut theory in Knives Out. Now we have Glass Onion, where the answer is in clear sight right in the middle, but it's surrounded by an attractive facade to distract you. And that's precisely what the movie is doing overall. The obvious answer is the correct one. Miles is the killer, because who else could it possibly be? But over the course of the flashback, you do find yourself kind of doubting that, going, well, maybe it is that other character. But of course, it makes the most sense for Miles to be the killer, because that's where the film's satire is. The movie is deliciously scathing, about Elon Musk that Miles is a paper-thin caricature of. And it really feels extremely satisfying for this character that likes to have everyone affirm that he is a genius, actually have everyone realise that he is a complete idiot without an original thought in his head, shamelessly lifting the creations of others and claiming them to be his own, like Musk, and the fact that he claims to have created Tesla, a company that he actually bought. But even so, Edward Norton is really having a lot of fun playing just this absolutely ridiculous character. And when they reveal just how completely just unoriginal he is, the fact that he literally steals suggestions from Blanc, that got huge laughs in my screening. And I mentioned in my initial review how a lot of the pandemic stuff, I wasn't sure how well that was going to age. But trust me, all this stuff about Elon Musk and Miles, that has only got more relevant and more timely since I saw the movie back in October. Since then, all the Twitter stuff has happened, and I feel like everyone else now has the same opinion of Elon slash Miles and can quote Benoit in much the same way. He's an idiot! However, that does lead me into expanding some of my criticisms about Glass Onion, specifically the fact I think it's a weaker whodunit than Knives Out. Now, I do have to say in reference to the earlier movie, I guess that Chris Evans's ransom was the killer before he was actually revealed, but even so, I feel like the actual construction of it was a little bit more controlled than it is in Glass Onion. You can feel that Johnson is trying to top himself here and deliberately making it much more outrageous and elaborate because that is part of the satire. And again, the movie is doing that very difficult walk in terms of tone where it could have very very easily succumbed to exactly the things it was trying to send up. And I do think it gets perilously close at times. But I think that because Johnson is having to do so many different layers and levels to what's going on, given the different perspectives that we see the events of the movie happen from, I think that that does result in a couple of plot points that feel like they could potentially be holes or maybe require 
a lot of elastic from the audience. But I think that this ultimately doesn't matter too much because a whodunit only has to really work on the first viewing. Where Knives Out and Glass Onion both succeed is that they are both still funny the second, third, and multiple times around. They are really effective as comedies and are very well written and also rewards you for going back to them and seeing all the clues that Johnson has been dropping. So in that way, I don't think that's too big of a criticism and actually it's negated by the fact that I think that Glass Onion is funnier than Knives Out. The laughs in this movie are even bigger. So even though I don't think it holds up quite as well in one area, in the other area, it perhaps succeeds even more than its predecessor. I also think that Glass Onion confirms what the likely structure of these Benoit Blanc mysteries is going to be, in that Blanc is a recurring main character, but he's not the instigating character. That'll be someone from the new cast of each movie. They'll be the protagonist and the actual hero of the piece. You think of Martha, you think of Helen in this movie. Blanc merely facilitates them, and that's precisely what he does. Blanc isn't just the disruptor, as I mentioned in my original review, which he totally is. I mean, he does that to Miles' murder mystery game that he is very elaborately set up, but again, not very creatively. So Blanc just wanders in there and just completely pulls it apart. And again, I feel like that's Johnson deliberately having fun with the audience's expectations because they put so much hype into the murder mystery and you think, oh, well, it's going to play out and then someone will actually get off and then it will turn real. But that's a little bit too obvious and a little bit too predictable. So he just completely dismantles it in front of you. And it's kind of amusing to see it so easily deflated. But Blanc isn't just that disruptor. He's also the distraction at the same time. Everything he's doing in the movie is to avert Miles' gaze from Helen cosplaying as Andy. So he's deliberately playing up his accent. I mentioned in my original review how I thought that Craig was kind of overplaying that kind of foghorn leghorn draw. But of course, that's exactly the point. He's playing almost a caricature of a caricature. You know, he's deliberately doing that so as to avert gaze away from someone who is actually doing the real investigative work for him. He is making a show of himself. That's why he disrupts the murder mystery game. That's why he does everything. So it is basically an elaborate game on both Blanc and Helen's part. And I think that Daniel Craig is enjoying getting to play a character that gets to be so offbeat and kooky even more in the sequel and doesn't have to be the absolute center of attention like a James Bond is. And in some ways that's kind of a subversion of the traditional detective mold. I think that Johnson is aware that a lot of the kind of traditional detectives, especially from sort of Agatha Christie, you think of Praro, who's exceptionally egocentric, they are always at the centre of those stories, whereas Blanc isn't. He's definitely there, but he's not the main protagonist. You've probably spent the whole video going, what's that great piece of art in the background? Well, it's no mystery. It's a movie palette. Imagine your favourite movie as a piece of art. But look closer, because each of these lines represents scenes or sequences from the movie. And also, if you look even closer, you can actually tell what movie it is at the bottom. In this case, it's Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And if you'd like one of your own, I've got a clue for you. Go to moviepalette.com and use the code FILMBRAIN15 to get 15% off your order. And then you can invite your friends to look closer. So those are my spoiler thoughts on Glass Onion, basically an addendum to my first video. I'd be very interested to hear what your thoughts on Glass Onion were. Did you agree with my thoughts? Did you have a lot of fun with it and big laughs like I had? Or did you feel it was something of a letdown compared to Knives Out? Either way, if you like this video and you want to support my work, you can give me a tip at my Ko-fi page or my YouTube Super Thanks feature, which is right below the video. Or you can buy some merch from my Tee Public page. 
or if you'd like to support the channel even further, you can join my Patreon, where you can see my videos early, among other perks, including access to my Discord server, or simply like, share, and subscribe. Those always help. Until next time, I'm Matthew Burke, fading out.